let's talk about your journey to begin with. You know, starting this journey in the time of your life that you're starting it in. Yeah. What what made you decide now was the time to take this on? And how long has this like story been simmering for you? I uh have always written like as a young, young kid, like I was writing stories and telling stories. And yeah, I tell this story all the time. It's true. My, I wrote my first short story when I was seven. And, um, and then I wrote a whole bunch of uh, detective stories, um, QWERTY, the detective, because I discovered Q-W-E-R-T-Y on the typewriter, because I was, I'm old enough that it was a typewriter. So QWERTY, the detective, I wrote like a whole series. And I told everyone I was going to be a writer, and they told me I couldn't be a writer. So I told them I was going to be a physicist, and they said that was okay. So I, I always have written, and I wrote, you know, through my childhood, and I wrote actually through college. And then I went to graduate school and I just stopped writing because graduate school was just a completely different type of thought process and writing and everything else. And then I got married and then I had kids and time passed. And I, I tried to write um, my, my son, my oldest, I was holding his baby sister. And I said, Zachary, could you go get me a tissue? I, th- I needed a Kleenex out of a box. And they're in the other room. And he said, sure, mom. And he's, well, if I was holding his baby sister, he was no more than five. So he ran off to get it. And it took him forever. And I'm like, (laughs) he finally comes back. It's like a, you know, ridiculous amount of time later. I'm like, where were you? And he said completely seriously, I'm sorry, mom. I had to battle the droids in the kitchen. (laughs) And I said, luckily, I said, I didn't know we had droids in the kitchen. Like I just rolled with it, you know, like we have droids in the kitchen. Cause I mean, he grew up in star Wars. Right. Yeah. So I was like, I didn't know we had droids in the kitchen. He's like, Oh yes. You know, we have droids in the kitchen. And I um, sat there so sad because I could no longer see the droids in the kitchen. Like I'm actually getting a little terror. I lost that magic. It was just gone. And I hadn't realized how, that imagination had always been a part of me. And suddenly like it was just gone. And I, you know, the babies ate my brain and, 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 you know, I grew up, I I did the Peter Pan thing. I grew up, I got old and I was just devastated. And I tried to write, I actually started a story called the droids in the kitchen. And it was about how there were just these dangers all around us and that the kids could see and we couldn't. And they were constantly saving the adults from, you know, catastrophe. And we had no idea. And um, I started it. And that's when I realized I have no idea how to write a book. I don't have the time to learn because, you know, then the third baby came and there I was. So time passed and 20 years went by. And um, I was working and I was raising children. I was doing all that stuff. And I think this is, I'm sharing all these details because I think this is a very, very common thing. Yeah. You know, I think, and I particularly, not that it doesn't happen to men, but definitely for women, I hear I had kids and that was sort of the be all and end all. And that's what I focused on and nothing else happened. And, you know, eventually my, the same kid who had to battle the droids in the kitchen uh, decided to go to college. And when he was applying for college, I was sitting at the kitchen table watching him fill out the forms online. And um, I had this epiphany, which was, um, they're going to leave. That was like the sentence that dropped down from on high into my head. Mm. And what it said to me is, these three children that I have spent all these years devoting all my energy to, my magnum opus, these, these kids are really my my best creation, they're leaving. They're going to go grow up and do things and become whatever they're going to become. And I'm going to be left here sitting at the same kitchen table with nothing to do Mm. except work at a job that I didn't love. That gave me a nice paycheck, but I didn't love. So I think a lot of people are in this kind of a position and you know, what happened to me is that I decided to start writing. So I did not begin my professional writing career until I was 45. Mm. And um, yeah, and so that's, that's where things started. I, I contend, though, that 
oftentimes when you when you do approach this later in life, you're in a better position to take on the story that you're about to tell. And this is a particularly apropos of your series because you've mentioned this in in a blog in blog posts and in and, and other interviews that this this series is really about balance and right. creating that balance. And I think only older, uh, more experienced people would understand that balance is so important. And so talk yeah. a little bit about balance, uh, about, about why you feel like this story is really about balance. Sure. Yeah. I think you're also, you're referring, I really wrote about this in, uh, for John Scalzi's blog. I wanted to write something for that, that people would like read and, and do what you're doing, which is not go, right. Yeah. I understand. <laughs> right. Sure. You know, um, one of the benefits to starting a, a writing career when you're older is that you have things to say that are interesting. <laughs> right. If I had really started writing when I was 20, 22, I, what would I have been writing about? Seriously. Right. Seriously. <laughs> I mean, I had nothing. So I thought I had stuff. No. <laughs> so, you know, from 20 to 45, there's a lot of stuff happens in your life. Right. And, and uh, you've got some, some dings and dents and uh, some aches and pains and a lot more perspective. And um, one of the things, certainly from my generation, I don't want to make myself sound like I'm old, but there's a difference between like where I am and like, where, where the 20 year olds are today. And for my generation, it was, we, we were the product of, you know, our parents. So it was the only person who can provide security for yourself is you. Yeah. Because we came from a generation where our parents were constantly getting divorced and people were losing jobs. And, um, and so we were like, we're going to go to work and we're going to earn money and we're going to do these things. And, you know, we're going to work until the work is done and you know we just that was our focus like we're going to create this security for ourselves i'm just talking very generally but i've seen lots of things written about gen x and like that's you know we're like okay yeah we're, we're gonna like get things done right for me as an adult and this is something that you know, kids these days know a lot better, have already seen, which is work needs to be what we do and our life needs to be the majority of it and work feeds our life, but it's not the, it isn't our lives. Mm -hmm. And I see a lot of younger people who, who seem to know that much more instinctively than I did. And sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. I mean, I've seen people complain, you know, all kids these days, you know, they won't, they, they want their weekends off where, you know, my generation, if work was done, we went in on Saturday, you know, like yeah. that was it. Like you just went, you just did it. In the end, I had to be in a position where it was like, what is important when I had uh, the sheer just blessing to come into my life, which is that in March of 2020, I was furloughed. Um, I had been working for 20, I've been working for 25 years professionally. I'd worked for 13 years at this last company and they furloughed me. I was very upset at first, but as you know, the country music song says, you know, sometimes unanswered prayers are the best. I wound up writing full time and I had not realized how much stress, I mean, I knew I was stressed. (laughs) <laughs> I was 24 seven stressed. I got that sinking feeling in my stomach at about four o'clock on a Sunday afternoon. Like when we were about, you know, when I realized my weekend's over, but even I was working still on the weekends because I was doing social media and that's 24 seven. So I don't know how long it actually took for that tension to leave my body, but it took a while <laughs> and like months and months and months of like almost having like some kind of a PTSD reaction where I'm waking up thinking, what have I forgotten? And then realizing, oh, nothing. I haven't forgotten anything. I don't have to go that place anymore. Mm-hmm. And that is uh, the balance that I was trying to get to with these books, which is I was starting to write these books. I got the contract for these books. I got furloughed in March, and I got the contract in, like, June. So, you know, everything sort of happened like it was supposed to. And so this was really on my mind at the time Mm -hmm. is how you find some kind of balance between the joys in your life, 
the responsibilities, the stressors, and the happiness? How, how do you do that? And it really plays out for Bex in this quite a bit. It's really the catalyst that keeps her from, you know, changing her lifestyle or doing this or doing that. She kind of works through all of that and tries to figure that out. I mean, yeah. even when she, and even when she thinks she has it, it kind of is on shaky ground for her. Well, you know, she she wants to spend more time with her family, right, with her yeah. sister and her her niece. And her brother-in-law is not a fan, um, yeah. not because he's a mean guy, but because he, he loves his family, wants to protect his family. And every time Beck shows up, something weird happens. And so she's trying to, you know, be a good friend and be a good sister and be a good aunt and be a good uh, girlfriend, girlfriend. Yeah. And do all of the things that she feels a responsibility to do. And they, those people want her presence. And at the same time, she feels this need to like block everyone off because every time she turns around, there's a demon showing up <laughs> yeah. and someone's put in danger because the big, you know, the big trick to her power as a summoner is that she cannot be harmed by whatever it is that she summons. But it, she realizes in book one, doesn't mean they can't hurt someone close to her. Right. So those, those, that love is a weakness in many ways. So. Yeah. You know, the other thing about balance that you play with a lot in this, and it, it comes from your own personal faith, is faith. Was that very important for you to make sure that you had some representation of your own faith within these books? Yeah, so I didn't set out to write a Jewish book, right? Like, it right. wasn't like, I'm going to write a Jewish book. I'm going to write an urban fantasy. And I wanted it to feel like an urban fantasy, like any other urban fantasy you would open up. If you're a mainstream urban fantasy reader, you, you'll you love the books. Yeah. You're still going to feel like that to you. But there is a little bit of write what you know, and I happen to be a Jewish person. And so when Bex is in, um, and I, I tend to write Jewish characters, and so when Bex was, is in a quandary, and I'm bringing something to that, her faith, because it's my faith, her spirituality sort of informs those decisions, right. right? Like, what's the right thing to do? And it, it's not, she just cannot be cold hearted. In fact, um, originally, I haven't talked about this before, Bex was supposed to be much uh, tougher, like much tougher. And in my first draft, my editor said she comes across as mean. Mm. And I had uh, written her that way because I had been asked to write a gritty urban fantasy. And so I wanted my character to be really like weathered and beaten and gritty. <laughs> right. and, and it turns out that writing a gritty woman character, it's very difficult. If you look at urban fantasy, and, I, and we can comment on stereotypes all we want. I'm just sort of talking about what is. When mm -hmm. you look at urban fantasy as a continuum, the far end of the spectrum are men, like Sandman Slim. Right? Yeah. He's not a nice guy, all right? Yeah. He's got like a, a, a central part of him that is a decent person, who, and that's why you can empathize with him. Wait, not nice, right? Yeah. Uber gritty. Um, I personally couldn't figure out how to write a female character like that. Hmm. Maybe that's just because... It's not who I am. Somebody mm -hmm. else will figure that out. But the reaction was, she's coming back as mean. And I had to recognize that there's a difference between, she could still be gruff. She could yeah. still be, say, not nice things. But she had to be empathetic. You as the reader had to still say, yeah, I understand why she's like that. Yeah. And it's the save the cat thing. The idea behind it is that you can have the grittiest character or the most acerbic character in the world, but if no one's looking and he climbs the tree to save the cat, you as the reader know he climbed the tree to save the cat. Nobody else in the story has to know, but he's sympathetic because of that. And I realized right. that's got to be Bex. She can still be a little acerbic and a little mean and a little bit like standoffish to other people. But you as the reader have to think, yeah, but I get why she's like that. Mm -hmm. 
And so I put Pinky in because he's the cat. And <laughs> I, that's what I told people. I'm like, Pinky's the cat. And Pinky, for those who haven't read it yet, is a six foot tall fairy um, who Bex winds up befriending. And he, he has some problems relating to other people. And um, yeah. he's, he's great. And, um, but he, he became the cat in my story. Her, her affection toward Nick Adamos is a little bit in that vein too, where she kind of, she feels sorry for him a little bit. And like, yeah. cause he shows her, he, he showed, he's shown her his vulnerability before. In the yeah. Of- yeah. So Gregory and Nick Adamos are a very interesting pair, right? They're brothers. Gregory as the older brother has taken it on to be this sort of tough, mobster in many ways very unlikable yeah but he too we know we start to learn his backstory and yeah. he, you know and now you're like well oh, maybe and nick starts out as a really arrogant person and if you um want to sign up for my newsletter you can get valifar's embrace which is a free prequel and it tells the story of what happens before demon kissed and Nick comes in, it's really Nick's story, and Nick comes marching into her office all cocky and <laughs> makes this massive demand and bad things happen. Yeah. And and that's and Demon Kiss starts after all of that has already happened. And like you're saying, he's very vulnerable at this point. And so she's sort of like just exasperated with him because on one hand she thinks you're a blooming idiot. I, I told you not to do this. And then on the other hand, it's like, okay, but yeah, like no one deserved what happened to you. So I feel really bad for you. Um, yeah. yeah. So I, I like that. I try really hard to make everyone complex. I'm curious about creating the lore that you create with Bay, Hell, and all the creatures that you use as, as helpfulness to Bexen throughout the storylines. And, and, I'm wondering how much you have researched what research wise shelved that you've discovered about these, how much, how deep have you gone and your thought process, because you knew this was going to be a series. So how, how, how do you feel like you wanted to sprinkle like little nuggets in, 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 in that respect? I do a lot of research for a lot of things, but in the end, um, you know, it's sort of, you know, it's my own thing. I mean, I use a lot of, you know, basic lore, like mm-hmm. Oberon is the king of the Fae. It's not like I'm changing that kind of stuff. That's like, that's it, you know, that's right. Kind of, but um, this idea that every time you say his name, he hears you and he might show up. Like, <laughs> that was just something that I thought was fun, you know? Yeah. Like, oh my God, <laughs> saying his name. What if he just walks in the door and says, stop calling me, you know? Um, <laughs> Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. You know? Right, right. <laughs> um, so I just was thinking, oh my gosh, what? Like, that, I don't think that exists anywhere. That was just, you know, <laughs> me being me. Um, and and sometimes accidents happen. Like, I have him show up at one point, and he's got a big dog, and I'm like, I didn't know he had a dog. <laughs> but <laughs> there he was, you know, and his name is Angus. I had no idea until he <laughs> showed up on my page. So, you know, Angus is a made up character. Oberon doesn't have, I mean, he has dogs. He's a hunter, right? But it, there's no right. Angus. But I thought, yeah, a dog. Why not? <laughs> Why not? Or <laughs> better with a dog. What supporting character surprised you the most that, that uh, you didn't have thought of? being a big part of the story that ended up being coming a big part of the story. Laurel. Um, oh, wow. Laurel. Yeah. So um, Laurel was a nice. character, character at the beginning. She was just the it girl, mean girl. Yeah. Um, if you walk for those who, again, who haven't read it, the book starts out with um, Bex uh, bartending in a fay bar badly. And there's this sort of group of pixies and Laurel is the lead mean girl. Right, that's what she is. She's a she's yeah. a new girl, and Bex is just very frustrated with her. <laughs> and I thought Laurel Laurel didn't even have a name. She was just the mean girl, and I thought 
she was just going to be that like caricature and that this group of mean girls and height like from high school was just sort of march in and out of scenes like just causing mm-hmm. that and then she grew into something completely different that's awesome i love that because yeah. yeah she's pivotal in a lot of a lot of where bex has to put two and two together she's yeah like, make changes and my friend darren kennedy who uh you know well and um is a wonderful writer his is my beta reader and um one of my two beta readers and he loves laurel like laurel he, he <laughs> always, you know love laurel laurel's a great character and she really wasn't originally anything other than a character mean it girl you've done this through bell bridge and did you do a lot of research to figure out what would be the best fit for these stories and and aim directly at that or was it kind of throwing a darts at a dartboard i was at a convention that has only happened once because of the pandemic it was a writing convention in um charlotte north carolina john hartness it's all his fault John Hartness, who is the as it usually is always is John Hartness is the publisher of Falstaff Books, who has I've also been published by many uh, three different novella series. Um, yeah. John said, you know, because he writes for Bellbridge, he is published through Bellbridge. He wrote the Black Knight Chronicles through Bellbridge, and he said, you know, um, I'd like to introduce you to the publisher. She's here. She's participating in the panel. I'd love to introduce you. And I was like, great, you know, fabulous. But I was writing my zombie cosmetologist novellas at the time and did not, that was where my head was. So I was moderating a panel and I I got there a little early and I sat down, I'm looking at my notes and the publisher comes in and she sits down next to me because she was on the panel. So she's there early too. And she sits down, she goes, literally goes like this. She goes, so Joelle, what are you working on? (laughs) <laughs> and this is the moment right so this is it this is the yeah, moment yeah. we wait for we wait we pray for this at night this is the moment that produ- that that script writers and novelists yeah. and everybody waits for their whole lives absolutely and the rule is you have three ideas the one you want to pitch and two backups and I had nothing, I mean, <laughs> nothing, nothing, zero. And I went, well, what are you looking for? And she said, I'm looking for a gritty urban fantasy. And I said, I can write that. She said, you know, I've been reading your zombie cosmetologist novellas and they lean more toward comedy. I want something that's like, comedies that there can be a comedic piece but i want it more gritty like i needed to mm-hmm. shift the percentages i said i can do that she's like okay send me something <laughs> so i walk out and i'm like okay, what did i just do <laughs> i have to write a gritty urban fantasy and i hadn't been thinking of anything i had nothing literally nothing so i keep in my phone I keep notes of mm. funny things that people say or new things or whatever, just things that maybe should be in a book. And I went back to, you know, where I was sleeping that night. I, I was staying at a friend's house and I went back and I sat in the, in my, in their guest room and I started flipping through my phone and months, a couple months before this, when I was still working full time, my team and I had ordered Chinese food and I got my Chinese food and I was eating it. And, you know, we all sort of like eating at the same time, chat, chat, chat. And I opened up my fortune cookie and it said, no one looks good in skinny jeans. That was my, (laughs) and I was wearing skinny jeans at the time. So I look at my friend who I had worked with for 13 years. I was sitting across from him and I said, I was just fat shamed by a fortune cookie. (laughs) And he burst out laughing and I thought, well, okay, maybe that was funny. And I had put it in my phone. Uh So flash forward, I'm sitting in this guest room looking through my phone and I read that line and I thought, that's a, that's the line. And so demon kiss starts with, I was fat shamed by a fortune cookie. Beck's sister says that to her and Beck says, did you eat it and show it who's boss? (laughs) And once I wrote those two words, I had Beck's like, 
I knew then awesome. that I had her. Wow. And um, and then I thought, but we need to start in Medias Race, right? We need to be in the middle of something. So I'm like, what's more in the middle than a car chase? So <laughs> I wrote her in a car chase and I wrote like, I don't know, the first couple hundred words that night. And I went to, and it's pretty almost unaltered from the first words that I wrote on like, that's in amazing. Little and I went to John Hartness the next day, still at the, obviously still at the conference, and I said, can I read something to you? And he was like, yeah. So I told him what happened, and he was like, okay, go for it. And so I read him those couple of hundred words, and he said the nicest thing, and I don't know if I've ever told anyone this. He said, he said, it's a good thing you're older, meaning like what we were just talking about, that I'm an older, you know, starting. And I said, why? And he said, because if you were this good just out of the gate at age 20, I'd be, I'd really hate you. And so <laughs> I was like, okay, that was a compliment, you know, roundabout way. And so <laughs> that's where it started. And I wrote, um, so I came home and I lost my job and I wrote the three, I wrote three chapters. Um, and then I wrote a synopsis and then just for giggles at the end of the synopsis i wrote book two will be this and book three will be this and it was one sentence each just nothing and like i gave it no thought i wrote it and I dashed it off and i sent it off and the message i get back is book two is your book one everything that you wrote in those first three chapters for book one is your backstory and see what you can do so i went back to the drawing board I kept the very beginning that I had talked mm -hmm. about. I rewrote the first three chapters. I wrote a new, I wrote, this time I wrote a full outline, not just the synopsis. And I wrote book two and book three will be this and this. And that's how it started. So, and then I got the contract. And so part of the reason I wrote Valifar, I published Valifar's Kiss for a prequel is because I had already written it. <laughs> that mm -hmm. was part of the original first three chapters. <laughs> So what, what does it mean to you? What do you, what do you love about being an indie author? Working with small and medium sized press does feel indie because yeah. it's, it's, it's very, very similar. In yeah. 90, I put it under all the same blanket. Yeah. It's like 99.99999% yeah. the same because yeah. these publishers, anything that is not New York big, um, yeah you're you're doing all the work you're still promoting yourself you're still um you know you're still out there trying to get your people to to follow you and to buy the book i mean you've still got to do all of that work you've got a few more resources behind you like they made the best covers for my series yeah they're awesome <laughs> so grateful for and and of course the editing and and the, all of that professional stuff so yeah, so the, the best thing about working either completely self or small medium press is that you have more opportunity and a lot more control to get things done, you know, and out there so people can read them. <laughs>